I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst at ITM Trading. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that if you enjoy this interview, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Lynette, thank you so much for joining me online today. Great to see you. Happy to be here, Charlotte. Thank you for having me. Yeah, really excited to talk about gold and silver and what's going on in the markets with you today. I think that before we get started, you know, this first quarter of the year, I think, has really highlighted the importance of having gold and silver in your portfolio. So my first question for you. Yeah, exactly. My first question for you is going to be if you can explain your approach to the precious metals, gold and silver, and how investors can determine the level of exposure that they should have. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, a lot of it, it's so interesting because we've had gold and silver as real money for thousands of years, but the current system, which is debt based, the governments and the central bankers really guided us away from us, uh, away from it at the same time that they're buying at hand over fist. So I would really say now, look, I've been studying currency since 1987. And at ITM trading, we have a strategy what, that we look at historical patterns and therefore what is the next most likely outcome. So you've got to have gold and silver in your portfolio simply because it's real in your possession, right? ETFs, all that kind of garbage. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. That That is just a trust. So you need physical in your possession, which is real money at a point where it should be now with inflation, obvious to everybody that central bankers have destroyed the purchasing power value of the currency. So that's why you have to have it. As far as the amount goes, that part depends on your personal level of comfort and what you're willing to lose and what you're wanting to protect. And then beyond that, do you want to get in a position to not just survive what we're going through, which is a currency reset, social, economic, and financial, but do you want to be in a position to take advantage of it? Because I believe, you know, I've been a stockbroker, I've been a banker, I've been in these markets on some level since 1964, quite honestly. And I've learned a lot over that period of time. But the system is so corrupt and fake right now. And what has to happen is a complete reset of the entire system. And that's why you need gold, but how much are you willing to lose? because they can drive the stock market up to a trillion dollars, but those dollars have no purchasing power. Last time I checked, a trillion times zero is zero. So because of my personal background, I do not own any stocks, any bonds, any ETFs, any mutual funds, any annuities, any, any of those fiat money products, government debt-based products. I am all in on physical gold and physical silver, which I hold. The other part of that, I think it makes a whole lot of sense to hold the lion's share of your wealth in an undervalued asset that is in a long-term positive trend and the least amount of your wealth in an overvalued asset or instrument that's in a long-term negative trend. And so the real trend is not the stock market or the cryptocurrencies or anything else. It's the purchasing power of the currency. And officially there's three cents left, but as inflation continues to heat up, because I, I do think we are in the beginning phases of the hyperinflation, then that will go to zero. When people lose confidence in the currency, it will go to zero then how much of your wealth do you want to be holding in these? Additionally, when I'm talking about value, because that's really what you want to know, where, where is it going to go, right? So what's the true value of an ounce of gold? That's also what I call the fundamental value, because one thing I can guarantee you is at some point, all assets go to fundamental value. 
That's not complicated. What gets a little more complicated and a little more nuanced is knowing how to determine what that value is. Because you can't listen to the guys on Wall Street to tell you what that value is. They have an agenda. So <clears throat> since gold is real money, good money, and dollars, yuan, yen, whatever, is government-based money, the way to know how much this would go to, an ounce of gold would go to during a reset, it, I, I do it really simply because I'm not going to get you to the penny and I don't care anyway about that, is you take all of the debt that's been created because that's how dollars are created or any government-based money is created by debt. And you can use that as a proxy for actually how much currency and how much fiat money has been created because they've taken that data away from us. And then you divide it by all the gold that exists in the whole wide world, whether it's in ground or it's above ground because gold is indestructible. And that the last time I checked, it'll be higher now because there's more debt. But the last time I checked, that was like 13,500 bucks. So with spot trading around, you know, 1940, 60, 80, 2000, 5,000 even, right? It's a bargain. So how okay, much of I, that do you want to own? <laughs> exactly. So you've laid that out really clearly how people can start to approach that. There's mm -hmm. a lot of points that you made that I want to follow up on. And one of them is, you know, you mentioned the central banks, the governments trying to, you know, direct us away from gold when they, in mm -hmm. fact, want it. And I think, you know, one of the things that we've seen over the last couple of months, really, in the headlines is, of course, the Russia-Ukraine war. And we've seen a lot of interesting developments come out of that. We've seen Russia setting the fixed price for gold the U.S. and others looking to block Russian gold transactions. So I wondered if you could speak about that and what that tells us about the value of gold. Oh, absolutely. Um, first of all, there is a certain cost because you can't push a button on a computer and create this, right? So the all-in mining cost is somewhere around, um, don't hold me to this because I have the data right in front of me, but somewhere around $1,268 an ounce. And then it'll go up from there, but that's where it is right now. So the all in cost, the cost to mine, um, and then to turn it into coinage or whatever else you're gonna turn it into, that actually supports the underlying price in terms of fiat money of, of the gold. But what we've also really witnessed is the US can block the gold sales from Russia in within their realm of influence so nato fellow nato countries or allies but you know not in china not in india and india frankly has a history of going around sanctions and trading with countries like iran um, turkey and venezuela and all these transactions have been done with gold because the currencies really have no value and so what we saw Russia do in the buildup to it is accumulate, get rid of, divest themselves of a lot of dollars and build their reserves of gold. And so they are not suffering as much as they would have if they didn't have that gold because that gold is really their savings. Taking it down to an individual level because that's what I really use all of these lessons for because it doesn't matter whether you're a government, a corporation, or an individual, the laws of economics really work the same for everybody. The governments and central banks just have the advantage that they could push a button and create fiat money out of thin air. But at the end of the day, they too have to go by all of those laws and restrictions. And so I would bring up in that same breath what we saw happen in Canada with protesters and how they were cut off from anything that they held in the system, just like Russia was cut off from what they held inside of the system that other governments could just take. Because the reality is, if you don't hold it, you don't own it, and your perception doesn't mean anything in a court of law. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good comparison that I think people can definitely look at and understand what's going on. So in addition to what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, we also have, you know, across the world, all eyes on the Federal Reserve trying to control inflation. So we got we got the latest CPI data last week. It shows inflation was up 8.5% year on year in March. But of course, many people think that CPI doesn't tell the whole story. So I want to check in with you on where you feel inflation stands right now in America and, you know, the impacts that actual consumers are feeling there. Yeah, well, it's significantly higher than 8.75, particularly when you look at food. What's that up 40 percent year over year and housing is up like 28 percent year over year. But they also have the cost of caviar in there, and I don't think that's gone up as high. And it's, seriously, they actually use this in an example. In you know, in the same category, you can have a can of tuna fish, you can have a can of caviar, and that's the same category. So you know, hedonics it kind of massages all of the numbers to make it look pretty, but when it's noticeable when you go to the grocery store to buy the food. Mm, it's, it's harder to hide, right? And, and they've really shown their hand. So to say that the Federal Reserve is, is trying to fight the inflation that they actually created by all of this money printing is preposterous because the only tool that they really have are interest rates. And, you know, back when we shifted in the, in the early 70s, and I was alive then, so I remember that. <laughs> you were a thought, maybe, but no, you know. But when you live through that, and I was like, in, I was my late teens. So I wasn't really fully aware of what was going on, but I was certainly old enough to get that experience. And we transitioned from a quasi gold back system to a pure debt-based system and handed over control of inflation to the central banks. And I look at history a little different than a lot of the history books because interest rates are used to regulate the rate and speed of the inflation. So if they wanna stimulate the economy, they drop interest rates down, more people borrow and spend. If that gets running too hot and becomes noticeable, they raise interest rates up to slow the borrowing and spending. And so that's how they've regulated inflation. But the problem is, is we're at the end of the currency's life cycle. And, you know, I've studied life cycles for 87, since 87. And frankly, you are at a much different point in your life cycle at your age than I am at my age or my grandchildren, you know, my granddaughter who's six, right? And everything has that life cycle. Everything has that age and currencies are absolutely no different. But we're anchored at zero. And we have been since the system actually died in 2008. And it's just been a scramble to try and put the new system to shift into in place. So when they talk about fighting inflation, well, this is, this is more of a supply than a demand-driven inflation. And that makes it different too. I mean, how many cars do you need? This is not about buying more cars. This is now about putting food on the table versus buying Netflix. And in the UK, I just saw an article today, I didn't read it through yet, but it said something about more people had disconnected from streaming services in the first quarter, you know, and it's because the, they're being pressed by inflation. So, yeah, I mean, Netflix, Netflix is, is almost $20 now in Canada, so you can, you can definitely feel it everywhere. Um, so I feel like I can guess what you might say, but I have to ask. So we do have, we've had one interest rate hike from the Fed so far this year. They are telling us that we're going to see more. They're talking also about balance sheet reduction. What do you see coming? What do you think they will actually be able to accomplish? I don't really think they're going to be able to accomplish very much, quite honestly. Do I think they're going to raise the rates more? 
Yes, they have to for credibility reasons. Are they going to run off the balance sheet? Oh, man. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that one. They may have to try for credibility reasons only, but, you know, the way interest rates work, when interest rates go up, the principal value of the bond goes down. And with them sitting on all of those mortgage-backed securities, all of those treasury securities, I mean, what, like $8 trillion worth? And remember, at 2000, in 2008, they were at $800 billion on their balance sheet, right? So I think it's like 8 or $9 trillion now. To run that off will push interest rates up a whole lot higher. It's going to become too noticeable for the general public, the deterioration and the, uh, you know, it'll, it'll call in another crisis, definitely, if they do that. So I think they're going to try and I think they're going to then pivot and they're going to go back to, because they don't have any choice. It, it doesn't really matter what they do at this point. Um, either way, it's a policy error. Either way. Right. And so where does that take us? We hear so many terms thrown around. We've been talking about inflation for the last more than a year, starting to hear stagflation thrown, thrown around, hearing about a recession. What is your view on, on where we go? I'm sorry, a hyperinflationary depression, because they have to burn off all of this debt. And this is a global issue. So, um, yeah, we're, we're headed into a hyperinflationary depression, which is what makes having this in your possession, along with food, water, energy, security, this is your barter ability, this is your wealth preservation, community, and shelter. You have to be prepared to be as independent and self-sufficient as possible. And, and of all those things that I've listed, Community is probably the single most important one because it takes a village, right? I mean, I'm pretty talented, but I can't do everything. You know, there's only 24 hours in a day. And so to grow your food and to do all of that, I, and I'm surrounded, I'm fortunate enough to be able to surround myself with a community that can help in all these different areas. Uh, but that's where we're going. And that's why I've been doing interviews with people that have lived through a hyperinflationary depression, or you want to just call it hyperinflation. It doesn't matter. People are not going to be in very good shape. Though, what I do want people to realize is that this is also an opportunity because wealth never disappears. It merely shifts location. And so you want to be in a position to have that wealth shift your way. And the way that you do that is you hold your purchasing power because what is severely overvalued right now will come down. And especially my uncle was very influential with me and he was a high-end antique dealer and he taught me how tangibles work, what the trend work looks like. And it's like a figure eight. So you always go from undervaluation to fair valuation to overvaluation to fair valuation to undervaluation. So right now, if you're looking at say real estate, it's up here and over maximum <laughs> overvaluation, right? But gold is near the bottom of undervaluation. So you want to position into those assets that are undervalued, which there's only gold and silver stocks, bonds, real estate, I mean, nothing else is. And then, right, when those assets that are overvalued come down, all right, well, guess what happens to gold, especially when they reset it against this funny money that really has no value. In, in Venezuela, overnight, they, they've done three overnight revaluations, but overnight, it went up 3,500%. Hmm, okay. Now, it was suppressed until then because, again, a rise in gold price is an indication of a failing currency. But, if and I'm not telling you to go down and buy real estate in Venezuela. I'm not saying that yet. But there will come a time when that will make sense. And then you'll be able to buy what's 
you know, million dollar houses right now. If it goes the way of Japan in the early 90s, which is my guess what we're going to experience, residential real estate dropped 85% and commercial dropped 95%. So, you know, but you will have something to work with to accumulate those income producing assets. There's the opportunity too. It's not all doom and gloom, but you got to hold your purchasing power and that's what gold is what will do that. Yeah, that's perfect. I was going to ask you if you could share some examples of where we've seen that before, because I think that would be really instructive for people. So I, that's very helpful. I also, so we're talking about, you know, this currency regime change moving towards something different. We know where we are now. We've talked about, you know, moving to, you need to hold your purchasing power and things like gold and silver and protect yourself. Can you talk a little bit more about where we're going and what's ahead of us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't like talking about this, but it's necessary to talk about because they're taking us into a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, and that is programmable money. So gold was the first money and you held it, you owned it, it protected you from inflation because it's got the broadest base of demand. It's private, it's decentralized. And even when you could convert it uh, into a gold certificate. If you didn't like what the government was doing, you'd just go in and convert this $20 gold piece of paper into a $20 gold piece. And that created restrictions around governments. So then they transitioned us into this funny money, okay? And this, the attempt, and successfully so, was about inflating the value away and getting the public to work for less and less and less money. And it, for gov that's for corporations. For governments, this was an invisible tax. But if the central bank creates a policy, it takes 18 months to run through the system before they know if that policy worked or not. So if you, held, if you hold a physical bill, that is still at this point invisible to the system. It does not protect your purchasing power, but it does protect your principal. Where they're taking us, and I've seen other signs of things that, that the IMF has talked about in their, uh, in their reports, but they're taking us into a digital currency that they control. So, hey, the central bank creates policy. We're a consumer-driven economy. You are not spending fast enough. Oh, let's drive those interest rates lower into negative territory. They actually say, once we are in digital form, there are no limits to how low we can push interest rates. And so if you sit there and watch your interest rates and your principal evaporate, then you're gonna go spend it. So in the new system with digital, there's no privacy. They can choose whether or not there's anonymity. And I'm thinking that anybody at the top will have access to that way more than the general public. They will have the ability to track every dime you make, every dime you spend, do, this is what they've talked about, lifetime taxes. And uh, they actually even used this example of a car in one of, their, in one of their research reports. You have a smart car. If you don't make that payment, well, guess what? Autonomous driving. Whoever, can, well, the contract, the smart contract could actually drive the car away. Okay, so that's where we're headed. They want every, everybody's, all of, their, um, all of their equity, whether it's in a house or anything else that they own, all physical assets, doesn't really matter what it is, held in token form digitally, and then that can be broken down so that you can actually spend your equity without even thinking about it, just like they've inflated away your purchasing power. And, you know, in 71, I'm telling you, inflation was a dirty word. But magically, it became the savior, but it's becoming a dirty word again. It's it's always been a dirty word. So, right. And yeah, no. And when you talk about these things, I think the key thing that people often want to know is when, when is this going to happen? It sounds pretty scary. How long do I have to 
be prepared. So I know that's that's probably impossible to answer, but what signs would you be looking at that would tell you, okay, this is getting very close? Well, I think we're seeing them now, but there are historical patterns and signs that happen around every single currency regime shift. Inflation is certainly one of them. War is certainly another one. I think it's also interesting that a women's movement, well, look at we had the suffragists in the start of this experiment. We had women's lib in the 70s, and we have the Me Too movement. Civil rights is another thing that's cropped up. You know, we had that back in the 70s. We have that again. So, and markets severely overvalued, this irrational exuberance, uh, and we're seeing the breakdown. So to be perfectly honest with you, and, and if you look at the new reports that have just come out from the IMF and the World Bank and the BIS, I'm gonna be reading the BIS later today, frankly, um, what you're seeing is they're telling you how close we are. And if there is another black swan event, which rising interest rates could certainly cause a systemic event that they would not be able to come in with their funny money and fix. So we're very, 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 very close. I mean, I, I, I mean, let me tell you, I'm very grateful. See, the system died in 2008 and I knew it. And that's when I was living in a little two bedroom condo, getting ready to retire, getting ready to travel and then the system died and I went, well, forget that. And I bought a property where I could start a garden. I have an urban farm. I'm not a gardener, that's not my thing. But food becomes the single biggest issue for people through these transitions and I knew that. And I believe my research because I know how deeply I, I dug. And if you just go back to March and April of 2020, when people were panicking, there wasn't food in the markets, you couldn't get toilet paper, all of that. If each one of us would remember back to that time, because I discovered the hole in my strategy on during that, and I'm so grateful because I had a chance to plug it. Uh, but look at where you were panicking and where you couldn't get what you needed and start to plug those holes and don't wait. This is not the time to procrastinate. I mean, what we're talking about is physical gold, for goodness sakes. This is not a pie in the sky. This is a tried and true. This has a long history. You get protected. Food, water, energy, security, barter ability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. Get it done now. This is a pivotal year. We're in 2022. A lot of changes are supposed to happen in 2023. I'm hoping, but it's already started. I mean, I mean, I don't, I'm sorry, Charlotte, because I wish I didn't have to say, I wish I could say, well, I think we still have, but honestly, I'm glad that I'm prepared. I'm, I'm very glad that I'm prepared to take care of myself, not just myself, but my family and my family's kind of expanses, expansive it. It also holds true for the people that I work with and, and lots of others. It's, it's why I really converted my entire property into an urban farm. Yeah, well, really don't don't apologize for, for telling us what's out there. I think you've given us some great advice. And you know, what I'm taking away is the answers are in front of you. If you look to the past, you can see exactly what you need to do because you see more people rush for during these, these times of turmoil. So we can wrap it up here unless you had any final words that you would leave people with as we we're heading into the rest of the year. You know, <clears throat> like I said earlier, community is probably the single most important thing. And a lot of times people have no idea who their neighbors are, but I think it's important to get to know your neighbors and, you know, make sure that you have as many of those bases covered as you possibly can there are, no matter where you're living, no matter what your financial circumstance is, there is a way to make sure that you have food security. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that anymore. Um, there's a way to make sure that you have financial security because the real, here's the truth, guys, gold and silver in any form 
are monetary at their base. This is a sterling silver chopstick that I bought, I oh God, I don't even know how many years ago now. Um, but if I needed to cut this up, I could cut it up. And people don't necessarily realize uh, what they really have. I'm good if it's broken and dinged and all of that. So your jewelry, Aunt Bessie's salt and pepper shakers, I mean, you accumulate it as you can and you make sure you know, at ITM, with the there's a formula that we use to determine how much gold do you need if you are going to stay in stocks, if you're going to stay in cryptos, you're going to stay in mutual funds, if you have a 403B that you cannot get out of, things like that, then you want to be properly diversified. And stocks and bonds or anything that you convert back into this stuff, that's not diversified. You've got to have real tangible money that's out of the system to be properly diversified. Okay, perfect. Lena, thank you so much. This was great. I think this will help everybody learn a lot. Really good to have you on and, and hear what you have to say. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Lynette Tsang with ITM Trading.